Hey guys, how you doing today? Um, I would like to talk to you guys about something called Hellmouth. It's a really funny word because I don't usually think of mouth and hell as having anything to do with each other, but yet here they're put together as one word. If you're wondering what a Hellmouth is, just stop and think, what do you think it means? Right? Just stop for a second and think, what do you think this means? It's a mouth that serves as the entrance to hell. You know, a mouth like this, right? Uh, but instead, on the inside, there's hell. So it's the mouth of hell. The idea could be seen as synonymous with the gates of hell, only when we say hell mouth, we're talking about a mouth as the entrance to hell, not a gate. Uh, the idea appears in literature and in theater and in art. And it's, it's quite prevailing throughout generations. Like it, it spans from the early... Uh, in art, it, it first appears in the early uh, 9th century, but it still continues even in some measure to this day. So it's not something that's ever really gone away, so to speak. But where did, where did we first see the idea of mouth, of hell, right? Where did we first see this? And the first place you actually see this is in the Bible. Um, in the King James Bible, uh, this is the King James translation. It's a popular Protestant translation. I'm not making any Protestant statement. I'm just using it because it's a nice translation. Um, Therefore hell, I put brackets around Sheol, uh, hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth. So before even the New Testament, we have this mention of hell as if there's a mouth. So no culture can say they created the idea of hell having a mouth prior to um, Christ's coming because it was already established before. So, um, let's talk about this for a second. Why do you think you would want to depict hell of a mouth, right? Well, if you lived in northern Britain, you were probably afraid of two things. So, I mentioned northern Britain. Why do I mention northern Britain? Uh, the Anglo-Saxons were really the first ones to start depicting hell in a... Uh, uh, as a mouth in an artistic manner. Yes, we have this uh, biblical text, but later on, Anglo-Saxons are the ones who start creating art. Now, why is it they did this? Well, there's two fears that you can think of. Think of the fear of being eaten alive, which is phagophobia, and think of the fear of eternal damnation, right? Now combine those two things, and that's pretty much what a hell mouth is, right? It's the fear of being eaten alive and the fear of eternal damnation combined into one. Now, one of those things I think most Christians understand, and that is eternal damnation, we are afraid of this, right? We trust in the Lord, hopefully more than we are afraid of hell, but there's still a reasonable sense to want to be afraid of something evil, right? Now, the other fear, however, I think we've kind of lost sight of in modern culture. I include that picture of the movie Jaws right there um, because that's probably one of the biggest modern ideas that, uh, um, that, that inspires this sort of fear of being eaten alive, right? And so if you think about the fear of being eaten alive, uh, the thought of a shark devouring somebody whole is a pretty scary thing. And also just the way it's angled is very similar to the way a hell mouth is angled. Look at the picture on the right, look at the picture on the left. Very different context. One's entirely secular, but you can't argue that there isn't some similarity in um, the fear itself, just like the immediate superficial sense of fear. Now, for the Anglo-Saxon living in the early 9th century, though, the fear of being eaten alive was not a fiction. It happened. Like, people would die because they they'd run into beasts. This is normal. A lot of their mythology... And if you ever read uh, now, um, the the uh, now if you ever read um, their mythology, one of the most obvious examples is uh, Grendel, right? Um, Grendel uh, in uh, Beowulf tries to eat people. So but there's all this sort of mythology around beasts that would eat people. It's it's a real fear for them, and their mythology reflects it. There's some debate as to whether or not um, the mouth of hell is the mouth of Satan himself. Uh, this is, I'm sorry if this imagery is a bit much, but it illustrates the point. If you've read Dante, you know that 
um, Satan is at the bottom of hell and he's devouring on three traitors, right? Judas and um, a contemporary of, uh, of uh, Dante and uh, Brutus. But some have argued that the idea of hell mouth leads us to believe that Satan is the mouth of hell. This idea is somewhat inconsistent as how can Satan be in hell if Satan is the mouth of hell? Like if the belly of Satan is hell, then Satan's not in hell himself. So there's a bit of an incontinuity there, discontinuity. Um, but both, both ideas have been depicted. That is true. You can find both ideas depicted. And so the scholarly debate between the two, I think, is somewhat in vain because, you know, it depends on whose depiction it, you're looking at. But you find depictions of it being both the mouth of Satan and the mouth of the beast, that is hell mouth. Now, the Vercelli dialogue, or I'm sorry, Vercelli homilies, are one of the first places that we find in written um, literature. It's uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, from an Anglo-Saxon, the Exeter book, which is a codex, um, that tells us the first place, one of the first places where we see hell actually mentioned. And so we can read this here, hell mentioned as a mouth, that is. And that what, what it is referring to is the mouth of a whale. Uh, when the whale opens his mouth, there's a sweet smell that allures fish. And the fish swim into the whale's mouth, and then the mouth, whale closes his mouth. And lo and behold, the fish fell for the whale's trap. It's not unlike how people sin, are allured by the smell of sin, the sweet smell of sin, but then they get trapped in the mouth of Satan. So here, it's making the comparison that the devil is um, the fish. So this is one example where it would seem as though the devil is actually the mouth of hell. So it seems to work that way in literature a lot more often, where the devil's mouth is the mouth of hell. But uh, I digress. So... There was an invasion uh, in northern Britain by uh, Vikings, actually. And when they did this, they left with them certain remnants of their culture but that would try to accommodate with a Christian concept. Um, so, for example, you have on the far right, that's a cross, the Gonster Cross, which is an old cross in Britain. And it shows this man fighting against a beast. Now... You and I might think of it as Christian or as Christ doing the herring of hell, one of the most popular hell mouth scenes where Christ goes through the mouth of hell to release souls from the underworld. But another interpretation is that it's actually um, Odin's son, Vidar, defeating Fenrir. Uh, Fenrir, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And so this is an example of how pagan mythology can be understood as are being Christianized. It's uh, um, a form of synthesis, not synchronization, but synthesis where you take elements of old pagan culture, but then you Christianize them. Um, so I should say, before I run out of time here, that the two most popular scenes depicted in, with the Hellmouth are the Harrowing of Hell and the um, Last Judgment. The Last Judgment, uh, you have Jesus Christ sending souls or they're going to hell for all eternity, into Gehenna. In um, the harrowing of hell, it's not actually hell in the way that we think of it. So hell is destroyed, but it's actually um, limbo, Sheol, or Hades, that Christ is releasing souls from. And so both of those two depictions, uh, the mouth of hell is used, right? So, in both the, um, uh, the um, airing of hell and the, in the Last Judgment, you have hell being used as an uh, image for uh, the mouth of hell being used as the image, even though it's a different thing. Um, so that's about all the time I have, and I think I did a good job touching the theological topics. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to email me or ask me in class. I did a lot of research on this, and it's... Pretty interesting. Um, these are some Renaissance paintings, so it shows that it goes up into the later centuries, even in modern culture, as I mentioned, but this is probably the last 
big usage of Pell Mell, Michael 